Welcome, everybody. Happy New Year. Glad that you're able to join us uh, for this. This is a January 2023, I have to get used to that, uh, novice meeting of the Houston Astronomical Society. And uh, with the turning of the uh, page on the calendar, we also have a new novice chairperson, and that is Chris Morissette. So uh, we were led by Debbie Moran for a number of years, and uh, Chris is now at the helm of the novice program. And we're excited for all the great things that he has in store for us, uh, starting first with this presentation today. So I'll go ahead and introduce um, Chris. And if you wouldn't mind, I think, Audie, you might be uh, coming in and out. Uh, we can hear you on the back end. If you wouldn't mind muting your, your um, microphone there. Okay, we'll do that. And uh, so to introduce Chris, Chris is now the uh, HAS novice chairperson, is an active member of the Houston Astronomical Society, the North Houston Astronomy Club, and the Fort Bend Astronomy Clubs, but we're going to hoard as much of his time as we can. Uh, he's also a member of the University of Texas Astronomy Department Board of Visitors. On clear Saturday nights, you might find him volunteering at the George Observatory, engaging with visitors and sharing his love of the night with them, while totally having fun operating the telescopes there, or you might find him at the HAS dark site, gaining experience with astrophotography. So it's my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce for the first time our new novice chairperson, uh, Chris Morissette. Chris, it's all yours. All right, well, thanks for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, let me see, I, will, I need to, oh, here we go. I'll and... stop the share there. And Chris, while you're bringing up your screen, I just yep. wanna remind everybody that as we go through the presentation tonight, if you have questions for Chris, please feel free to use the chat feature that we have in Zoom here, and we will uh, get to those. If you're watching on the live stream and Facebook, uh, ask your questions there in the Facebook chat. We'll also get to those at the end of the presentation as well. Great. And can you see my screen, Joe? We do. It's not in presentation mode. It's, it looks like it's coming right, up. Let, but, uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me get it in full screen here. Okay. You, there we go. Okay. Good. We all good to go there. You can see I think the we're good screen. to go. Yeah. Looks all good. right. Excellent. Great. Well, listen, uh, Joe, again, thanks for that uh, nice introduction. I really appreciate it and uh, want to welcome everybody to the first novice presentation of 2023. Um, we will be discussing the winter sky, probably my favorite time of year for looking at the uh, at the at the cosmos. Um, the topics that I'll be discussing tonight are the following. I want to spend a few minutes up front talking about uh, preparing for the elements. You know, what kind of clothing, what kind of materials you may need in order to make sure that you are uh, warm and safe during these uh, cold winter nights. I'll then have a quick uh, refresher on navigating the sky. Uh, it'll be uh, kind of centered on the celestial sphere and some resources that are available. We'll then dig into the topic for this evening, uh, hot and heavy. Uh, we'll talk about Orion, the constellation Orion, and how we can use that as a useful sign point, post to find our way around to see various winter sky objects. And then we'll um, dive deep into the various winter sky objects that are available for viewing. And there are many wonderful accessible objects out there. I'll spend a few minutes at the end with a, a, a thank you to Debbie Moran, our previous novice chair. Um, and uh, after uh, doing so, if others have uh, words of, uh, uh, of thanks and gratitude they'd like to pass on to Debbie, then the floor will certainly be open for that. So winter is here for about two weeks. And I know we had one of those two weeks over the Christmas uh, 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 weekend. Uh, and it was cold out there. Uh, I know up here in Kingwood, my thermometer dropped down to about 16 degrees. So while we are in a semi-tropical area, uh, this area of the country can get cold. So it's always good to remember that. As a general rule, when you're going out and uh, spending a night under the stars, it's a good idea to dress for about 20 degrees colder than it actually is going to be. Um, when you're out stargazing, there's, aside from setting up and tearing down, there's not a lot of physical movement that may be involved. So it's just standing still makes you susceptible to getting cold. Putting on some extra layers more than you typically would uh, is not a bad idea. 
I've made a list of um, of clothing recommendations that uh, I certainly employ. I just go through the list rather quickly. So, you know, starting from the top of the head, uh, a beanie is uh, always in uh, in uh, in May. In uh, yeah, it's a good idea, um, especially for those of us that don't have as much hair as we used to. Um, you lose a lot of heat out there. Uh, then a, a nice winter coat is uh, is recommended. Uh, thermal or moisture proof pants are a good idea, and I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about in the next slide. Gloves, obviously. Uh, thermal socks. Um, foot and hand warmers, the kind that you bust open that are kind of the gel pack and that uh, once you break them open, they start to emit heat. Those are handy for putting in your pockets or, or putting in your in your boots. Um, boots are a good idea, especially if you're out at the dark side in an area that has a lot of uh, uh, grass and is kind of a pasture uh, area. I like to wear boots that are kind of akin to a cowboy boot. The sleeve that comes up the calf of your leg is good to uh, keep out uh, the uh, cold and the moisture. And then long underwear, if you've got them, both top and bottoms uh, are a good idea as well, especially if you're going to be out there for any length of time. It's also a good idea to take a blanket out there um, in case you want to sit down and and uh, and take a, a, a just kind of take in the sky from from a lawn chair. Uh, you want to have something to kind of cover you up and give you an extra layer of insulation. I put together this slide is just to kind of show you an example of what I wear. Um, of course, we got the beanie up here at the top and uh, this nice uh, down jacket that I brought with me from California about 40 years ago. And then um, these pants that you see here are kind of, uh, they are like uh, uh, snow pants. Uh, they're, they're kind of like overalls. And these overalls are nice because they can be put on over your your street clothes, your jeans, and a, you know, and your shirt, and it goes up underneath your jacket, which is great because uh, that's it. Just kind of is more of a foolproof way to keep the moisture out, which is what I like about them. And obviously, the extra layer of insulation is 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 great too. Uh, here are the socks I was talking about. These are just kind of your typical. Uh, hiking grade uh, socks and then down here is a uh, one of those uh, heat packs that you can buy and open up and either put in your boots or your or your pockets. Over here is a kind of a cool blanket that I ran into and bought last year. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of like a thermal blanket. You can kind of see here I got it folded back here, but it's got a hood on it and that hood is sort of makes it uh, like a poncho. And there's a couple of buttons up at the top, so you can kind of button up and you can put it over yourself. Uh, very uh, uh, convenient, keeps the moisture out, and above all, it adds an extra layer of, of insulation, which is nice. Uh, when Debbie did this uh, talk last year, she mentioned electric socks, and I have a hard time keeping my feet and toes warm, so I was intrigued. And I did a little bit of research after that meeting and lo and behold, I found a pair of electric socks on Amazon. And I went ahead and bought these suckers. Uh, they just have the uh, lithium ion batteries that you plug into a little cable coming out of the sock here. And then you tuck it back up underneath into a pocket that kind of sits below this, uh, this switch. Now these particular socks have three different settings. There's hot, medium, and cold. Uh, this one's hot. And this one's cold, and there's another setting that's medium, which kind of makes the, the light glow white. Excuse me. And then um, the uh, once you turn these on, uh, you know, you're, you're, it really does a great job of warming up the feet. Uh, obviously, if the lower the setting that you use, the longer the life will be. But even on uh, the highest level, I can get about a five hours worth of, of uh of service out of these things before the batteries go dead. These babies ran me somewhere in the neighborhood of $75, $80 if memory serves me right. So they're not cheap, uh, but if you're like me and you have trouble keeping your feet warm, uh, they're really great, really nice accessory. So just a few items there about how to keep yourself safe and warm while you're out underneath these uh, cold winter skies. Now we'll take a, a, a brief moment and just have a quick refresher on navigating the night sky. 
And I'll start out with the celestial sphere. So if you think about the cosmos, if you think about the stars and the various deep sky objects, the sun and the planets, they follow a, uh, a certain pattern out there. The stars and the, uh, the more fixed objects, if you will, stars, deep sky objects, constellations, etc. cetera, uh, everything really that's basically outside of our solar system, they sit on this imaginary sphere. And as the uh, sphere, the sphere appears to rotate during the night, which is in really in reality our, our Earth moving in this and and, and and giving the illusion that the stars are rotating. But this is kind of the the map or the globe, if you will, to kind of understand where where various items are, various stars, various um, uh, deep sky objects, etc. And just like our own um, a globe of the Earth. There are a couple of demarcations that'll help you pinpoint a particular location. So, for example, this star has a certain coordinate called a right ascension, which is analogous to longitude in, uh, on, our, on our own globe of the Earth, and declination, which is analogous to latitude. So, with those two coordinates, you can find uh, the location of a particular star, particular deep sky object, um, constellation, etc. Now, the, uh, the planets and, and, and our sun as well really uh, go uh, follow along this, uh, uh, this line here called the ecliptic. And that is really kind of the plane of the solar system. So they follow a different uh, path, if you will, uh, relative to the stars and uh, deep sky objects that are out in the cosmos. Um, but but the, the ecliptic is, is uh, a way to understand uh, the pathway for those those objects. Um, we've got a also uh, uh, related to the sphere here. We've got a celestial north pole. So the axis of the Earth going up north and out into the cosmos is the axis around which this sphere rotates. And the celestial north pole points to uh, the North Star or Polaris. Uh, so that is a, a key item in terms of understanding you know, where where we need to look during the course of the evening. Um, so Polaris is important and it will depend on your latitude um, in order for you to determine where to look up in the sky. So, you know, for, if you're at the North Pole, Polaris will be right above your head at the zenith and everything in the night sky will keep the same uh, declination. The right ascension will change, but it won't. It won't change uh, from uh, with respect to its declination. It's going to just stay at one at one uh, uh, one level here on the sphere. If we're here in Houston, uh, we're at 30 degrees latitude, give or take a degree. And so, when you're looking north and you're looking up above the horizon, if you look at 30 degrees, you'll see Polaris. And if you'll notice. Polaris throughout the evening will not change its location. It stays stationary, whereas other objects, other kind of stars, constellations, et cetera, will. They'll rise in the east, southeast, come up over our head, and then down and, and set in the west. So Orion, which is going to be kind of the, the main uh, feature for tonight's talk, uh, it will come rise up out of the southeast. Uh, not. Not, not hit the zenith, but come pretty darn close, and then um, uh, set over in the western uh, part of our skies. So that's just a kind of a quick recap of, hey, how, you know, where, you know, what's the whole, what's the game plan look like? What's that night sky? How is it structured? How can I find my way around? And it's just, just kind of a quick, a quick reminder on, on um, what we're looking at. The uh, the sky maps website. Um, offers a free map uh, for each month, uh, depending, and they offer it for the northern latitudes, equatorial, and southern latitudes. This one here is for our northern latitudes, and these are a great tool, a very simple tool that you can go and download and print, and what you can do with this map is take it out into your backyard or your driveway, and if you're looking uh, due south, you would just have this map um, in its normal position with south at the bottom of the of the map here and for this particular map in early january this 
gives you an idea what the sky looks like around 8 p.m. Later in the month, it'll be more like 7 p.m. Uh, but, but for this time of the month right now, 8 p.m. is what you'll see in the sky. And as you can, as you notice here, you'll see Orion over here in the southeast uh, coming up and um, uh, Taurus in front of that and Gemini over here more towards the ecliptic and so on and so forth. So this is a really just a handy, inexpensive tool to help get oriented on the, you know, with respect to the night sky. If you're going to be facing north, and we will in this, in this uh, talk tonight, what you want to do is as you turn north, you want to take that piece of paper and rotate it 180 degrees so that north is on the bottom of the sheet. And then again, this will give you a view of the sky at seven o'clock at night um, or eight o'clock at night, rather uh, early in January of the various uh, constellations that are up. And in particular, tonight we'll be focusing on Cassiopeia and Perseus. So those are those will be two, two uh, constellations of interest as we're facing more. Um, Debbie uh, had uh, got me turned on to these two books from H.A. Ray last year uh, when I was preparing for a novice talk, uh, one called The Stars and one called Find the Constellations. Um, this is one point of continuity I want to keep in the novice program. I want to keep these books as a highly recommended tool for novices. Granted, they're written by a children's author and are kind of somewhat geared for, for young adults and, and kids. But these are fantastic references for anybody that's new to astronomy. So if you're really at a at ground zero and trying to you know get, gain an understanding of astronomy, these two books are really a, a, a wonderful place to start, and I, I highly recommend them. As you uh, grow in your knowledge of astronomy, it's always great to pick up a uh, full-fledged uh, sky atlas. Um, here are three. Uh, uh, very good atlases uh, uh, pictured here. Uh, those are a great addition to any library. And again, I remember using turn left at Orion, a lot of great information and detail in there. Now, my personal favorite is uh, the deep, is, uh, deep Map 600, which is this baby right here. This right here, in my opinion, is a star atlas in the, in, uh, that is no bigger than a gas station map fits in your pocket. It has a nice cover that's waterproof and it's it's just really simple. Um, the front part of this thing is the celestial sphere that's kind of laid out in rectangular form like a world map that you'd see on a wall in a, in a school room. And it's got all the constellations plus a number of great deep sky objects listed. And then if you flip it over on the back, you've got this table that's got all kinds of great information uh, for each of the objects that are listed on the front. And it's just, like I said, it's a uh, it's a sky atlas that, that uh, fits in the glove box of your car and easy to carry around. A lot of people, and myself included, are using apps on their phone. Um, so Stellarium, uh, Sky Safari, and uh, Sky Guide are three that I'm familiar with. Um, my intent uh, one of the actions I have as the novice chair is to develop a, uh, a presentation that we can have uh, during these sessions to go more into detail on the different apps that are available, how they work, um, you know, uh, benefits, uh, pros, cons, etc. Uh, haven't gotten around to doing that, uh, but uh, I do have it on my list to do and uh, look for that um, maybe uh, early next year. I've got to I've got to do some research on that. So uh, those but those are a great tool as well. So let's get into the uh, the main uh, meat of the discussion tonight. Talk about Orion as a signpost. So this is a uh, this is actually a screenshot off of uh, Sky Safari, and this is what you can see tonight at nine o'clock. And I think we've got a nice uh, night out tonight. So. Uh, it would be uh, something that you could take advantage of after the meeting. But uh, excuse me just a second. What you see here in this picture is Orion uh, about halfway up the up the sky. 
uh, between the horizon and the, and the zenith, and it's uh, roughly in the southeast. And Orion, you just can't miss Orion. It's one of those uh, stark, brilliant um, uh, constellations. Um, you've got those three stars in the belt. You've got Betelgeuse and Rigel, which are the two bright stars. This is Betelgeuse and Rigel here. Very vivid, very bright, very easy to find, and it's just a it's just a wonderful uh, place to start our journey. Here's a, a, a more detailed map of Orion, and I like to show this one because you can see the various uh, neighbors that uh, Orion has, and we'll be going over to these neighbors tonight in our journey through the list of uh, winter sky objects. So you have Monoceros here on the left-hand side of Orion, uh, Gemini up over the uh, right shoulder. You can't see it pictured here, but up above the head in and shoulder is uh, Auriga. Uh, over the, uh, I guess it would be the left shoulder is Taurus. And uh, down here at the bottom is Eridanus. Um, Again, we'll be going to Monoceros, Gemini, Taurus, and Orion tonight, but uh, that's, that's just a more detailed map, if you will, of Orion. So if you don't get anything else out of this talk tonight, I hope you do get something out of this one slide here, because this is um, how we can use Orion as a signpost. And um, I'll just briefly go through the various ways that we can use this thing, to use Orion to get us to different points in the cosmos. So if we want to get over to Ald Aldebaran, which is the bright red star in Taurus, we would follow the an arrow from the, the belt, uh, kind of from lower left to upper right, and follow that out. And if you follow that straight line, you'll, you'll run into Ald Aldebaran. Now, one thing to be aware of, Mars is up near Aldebaran as well, and Mars is a kind of a bright red dot in the sky. Aldebaran is a, a red dot in the sky, but it's not quite as bright. So you have to do a little work to understand well, which one's Mars and which one's Aldebaran. If you follow the signpost, though, that will get you to Aldebaran. Um, going back the other way, uh, from upper right to lower left on the belt, that'll take you down to Sirius. And Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, and it's the main star in um, the constellation of Canis Major. And again, we'll be going down there as well. Following uh, from Bellatrex and Betelgeuse off at the top here, if you follow that, uh, those two points, and, and follow that arrow on out, that'll get you to another bright star called Procyon, and that is the uh, brightest star in Canis Minor. And again, we'll be going out that direction as well. And then if you go down here from Rigel up through Betelgeuse, that'll take you out to Castor and Pollux, which puts you in the constellation of Gemini. So again, it's a neat, it's a neat trick. It's a neat methodology to use these uh, constellations as signposts because it makes it very easy for you to get around and understand where you're at. And uh, Orion's probably the best one. It's uh, very bright, very vivid, very, very visible from our latitude, and uh, it serves a, great, uh, a really good purpose in, in, in that respect. So we've got our signposts. Now we're going to uh, take a look at some of these uh, winter sky objects. And we've got a nice list together. I mean, again, uh, the winter has such beautiful objects out there. Um, I just love it. We're going to start with Orion, though. Well, rather than move away from Orion, let's start in Orion because Orion's got some really cool uh, deep sky objects in it. Um, and in particular, we're going to look at this region right here, uh, which is down uh, below the uh, the belt of Orion in in an area called the Sword that Orion has, since he's the hunter. And we're going to be looking uh, first at the uh, Great Orion Nebula, or M42. And then we'll be looking at the Horsehead Nebula. This is a, uh, a beautiful image from uh, Rob Torrey that shows um, that same uh, area of the sky that I've got highlighted here in a, a picture. I had to rotate this thing uh, counterclockwise 90 degrees in order to get it to fit on the slide. But here you can see Orion over here. And here down here is where we'll see the Horsehead Nebula. 
So we'll start out with Orion, the Orion Nebula. Now, the great thing about the Orion Nebula, it really can be enjoyed uh, with a multitude of different uh, viewing techniques. So it's visible with the naked eye. It shows up as a faint fuzzy patch of light, but it's certainly distinct and, and you can find it. Um, binoculars are great, small telescopes, large telescopes, and even electronically assisted astronomy is, is uh, beneficial for looking at this. You might say, well, gee, if I use a large telescope, you know, wouldn't I be cutting out um, the field of view of the object? And you would, but there, there's detail in, this, in the core of this, uh, of, the, uh, of the nebula, in particular, the trapezium, which are these four stars down here, that uh, really make for great viewing even with larger telescopes. One thing I wanted to mention, as I go through these objects, I'll be throwing out various ways that you can view these objects. Um, and you may be trying to take mental notes or write written notes. Don't, don't worry about that. At the end of the presentation, I put together a slide uh, that has a list of all the objects and viewing options that I've personally been successful using. Uh, they're not the be all end all, uh, but they are uh, uh, the options that I can vouch for. And I'll, I'll say more about that at the end of the presentation. But this is a, a nice uh, sketch that somebody would do if they were uh, strictly a, visital, a visual astronomer. Um, here's a nice uh, view of uh, Orion through a small telescope. So uh, you're not able to see maybe all the nebulosity there, but you'll be able to pick up uh, quite a bit around in here. And then, of course, here's the, the four stars that make up the trapezium. Of course, Hubble has got into the act, too. This is a very detailed, vivid drawing, or vivid picture, rather, of um, Orion from the nebula. But I, I'm kind of partial to this one from Dawn. It uh, has all the detail that I think the Hubble one did, but it's a little bit uh, more straightforward and, and allows us to kind of... Um, really study the study the object and not be distracted by all the different colors but this is this is a wonderful rendition so let me talk a little bit about orion because it's a in addition to being a very accessible a very beautiful object very, very, it's a very interesting and important object so orion is approximately 1400 light years from earth it is about 35 light years in size so if you look at the field of view here this is roughly 35 light years in size. The, 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 the key thing about Orion, it's an emission nebula, which means that starlight is actually ionizing the, the, the gas or the nebulosity around the, the various stars. And it's the, the closest region of massive star formation to, to us. So that's really kind of its, uh, its chief uh, claim to fame here. Um, this, the, the nebulosity in this area is is uh, conducive to condensing and forming stars. And that's why uh, this particular uh, object and region of the sky is, is, is very important. So again, it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful object. Uh, if you haven't ever looked at this before, I highly encourage you to do that. It's just, uh, it's, it's not only fun to look at, beautiful to look at, but it's important scientifically. So it's, it's really got everything going for it. Okay, let me grab a quick drink here. And uh, we'll now uh, go on to our next object, which is uh, really beautiful as well as the Horsehead Nebula. Now, the Horsehead Nebula is up here in Orion's belt, and there's star, the lower left star up here is called Almatak, and that's where you'll find the Horsehead Nebula. Okay, so here is another image of that region. Uh, one provided to us by Jeff Lepp, and right here is the Horsehead Nebula. Now, the Horsehead Nebula is an interesting critter. It is what they call a dark nebula, and what that means is that, uh, or an absorption uh, nebula, it means that the the type of material of this, uh, uh, the cloud of material in here is so dense, it's actually obstruction, obstructing or obscuring uh, starlight and um, ionized nebulosity behind it to kind of give us this shadow. 
So it, it's uh, it's cool to find. I remember the first time I saw it in the sky, I was really jazzed about that. But it's a uh, it's interesting from that respect. Um, this object's about 1,600 light years away, and it's very small. It's about three light years in size here, so it's not a very big object. Um, the nice thing about finding and looking at the Horsehead Nebula is you've got a lot of nice neighbors in the uh, really close next by, even in the you know the same field of view. So over here is the the Flame Nebula. Uh, that is an emission nebula, and then you have three or four reflection nebulas. So an emission nebula is where the energy from the stars is ionizing the gas and then making it glow. Uh, reflection nebulas where the starlight is actually reflecting off of the gas and the dust cloud that that may be out in the cosmos. So here's a reflection nebula here. I believe this one here and I believe this one here is a reflection nebula. There's also uh, five stars that are up here that are actually gravitationally bound to each other. I think that's what we've got right here. So in one field of view, you got a lot of cool, neat things going on. And again, uh, the Horsehead Nebula is uh, is just a, a wonderful specimen, a wonderful dark nebula to um, to take a look at. This one probably will require something more in the in the neighborhood of EA electronically assisted astronomy because it's so small and and it's dark um, you need some assist in order to see it um, others may have been able to see this with a large telescope at a very dark site uh, but my, again basis my own experience that's what that's how I've been able to see it Okay, so we've got a couple of really neat objects in Orion that we've looked at. Now we're going to use our signpost functionality, and we're going to go over to Monoceros, or, and the bright star Monoceros is Procyon. So from Bellatrex and Betelgeuse, we'll head out this way. We'll probably run into Procyon out here outside of the boundaries of the slide, but roughly half to two-thirds of the way from Procyon towards Betelgeuse, you'll find a nice object here called the Rosette Nebula. And uh, here is a, uh, uh, an image of the Rosette Nebula uh, 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 furnished to us by Brad Burgess. And the Rosette Nebula is approximately 5,500 light years away. It's about 130 light years in, in, um, in size. And a cool, interesting thing about the Rosette Nebula, the, the center of the nebula is actually being hollowed out by some very intense uh, stars that are sitting here in the center. Uh, what's happening is, is you're getting uh, things called stellar winds coming off of these stars, and it's actually pushing out uh, the gas from the center of this nebula. So kind of an interesting phenomena. We'll see an example of that later on when we go to Cassiopeia, uh, but the Rosette Nebula is again, a um, very beautiful object to, to look and see in the sky and has that interesting feature. And again, it's an, it's an emission nebula akin to um, M42. Okay, so now we're gonna go over to Taurus and we're gonna get away from uh, the nebula is a little bit more into star clusters. So Taurus is the bull. Um, Aldebaran is right here. It's a really bright star here. And if you follow the stars up here and here, you get what are referred to as the horns of the bull. To me, it kind of resembles a wishbone. Uh, but either way, uh, you know, that that's um, that is uh, uh, a, a, a way to think about it. Um, down here is the body of the uh, of the bull, and then in and around here is where we'll be focusing most of our attention. All right, so here's a picture of uh, Taurus, and you can see Aldebaran right here, and there's the Hades uh, star cluster right here. We'll be looking at that, a couple of features there that are pretty neat, and then Pleiades, which is a knockout. Uh, probably one of my favorite objects and uh, has an interesting structure that I'll, I'll describe as well. All right, so let me, I'm, one thing I want to make my audience aware of, I cannot read fully my captions on the slide, so 
if there's information there that I'm just kind of brushing over, that's the reason why. So forgive me for that. Okay, so the Hades is a uh, open star cluster. It's about 150 light years away from us. Uh, there are about three to 400 stars in that star cluster. And there are five main members that are all red giants. Um, this is a good piece of information to know. And several of the other star clusters we'll look at have the same feature. And that, that is they have some they have some stars that are different colors than the than the typical run-of-the-mill star. This is helpful because if you're not sure you're on the uh, star cluster itself, uh, going and identifying where these say these five red giants are will help you confirm that yes, indeed, you're looking at the right part of the sky and you're looking at this particular uh, this particular cluster. Um, Aldebaran is not a member. Uh, it is a foreground star. It's only 65 light years away. So while it appears to be uh, part of the cluster, it in effect is is not. Um, there's a there's uh, two or three asterisms that are in uh, Taurus that are of note. Uh, there's Alley's Braid, which is a string of stars in Pleiades. Uh, you can't really see it from this. Uh, this slide, but I'll, and I'll but I'll show you where, what that where that asterism is when we uh, we get to the uh, a picture of, of Pleiades. There's Davis's dog over here, a Delta wing, and then down here, which is really cool, is the triple double, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next. So I was out at the um, at the HAS Dark Site Novice Lab uh, last month. Had a beautiful night out there. And we uh, saw the triple double, and the triple double are these co this collection of stars right here. Uh, these are th three uh, uh, pairs of binary stars, and they form a really unique uh, pattern. They almost look like an equilateral triangle up in the sky. Um, and I'm not much of a star cluster fan. I mean, I think they're interesting and and cool to look at, but um, I never really appreciated them much. This kind of changed my view of things because that pattern was very striking up in the night sky and uh, very, very cool to look at. Um, easily seen with binoculars out at the night, out at the dark site uh, in a small telescope, obviously, um, but it really shows up great in binoculars because the, the field of view is wide enough to really, really take it all in. Um, I can't remember if I saw it naked eye, uh, but I'm sure somebody with some sharp eyesight out at the dark site could certainly do that. But uh, again, it's really cool um, to be able to see this and they're so symmetric. And I think that's the thing that kind of captivated me when we were out there looking. So the triple double is definitely worth looking at. I actually went out uh, on the driveway last night with my binoculars and I was able to find these stars and see them, These, this pair right here is very faint. So I kind of had to look out the corner of my eye, but I was able to pick it up. Um, the next item that we'll look at here is uh, Pleiades. And I love Pleiades. Uh, Pleiades, again, um, is in Taurus and it's a star cluster, but it's unique star cluster. Now, in order to find Pleiades, what, what I do is, again, I take the, I follow Orion's belt over here to Aldebaran. And then once I get to Aldebaran, then this picture doesn't quite show it um, properly, but or at least from my perspective out in the uh, out of my driveway or out at the dark side. But I'll go from Aldebaran. And I'll look straight, just go straight up into the sky, and I can reliably find it. Um, and I think if the orientation of this uh, slide was um, what we actually had out in the sky, that'd probably be what you'd be. Uh, how, how you, where you would be looking. Okay, so um, Pleiades, it's about 75 million, or, merely million year old star cluster. Um, and it is unique uh, from the respect that um, it is a star cluster, but the, the stars are very uh, bluish tinted in nature. And the reason for that is because the star cluster is actually in close proximity to a, a, a nebulosity that's that's uh, lingering out there in the sky. And the nebulosity is actually reflecting uh, the starlight from Pleiades. 
uh, from the star cluster. And that's how you get this blue uh, tint, blue haze to it. The star cluster and the nebulosity are not related. In other words, the, the, the uh, nebulosity is not the remnant of the material that uh, created Pleiades. It's just really two ships passing in the night. And because of that, we're able to get this really wonderful uh, reflection nebula or ref, you know, reflection off of this nebulosity up there. Um, Pleiades is about 430 light years away. Uh, it's about 15 light years in size. And um, again, that's a really cool story. Uh, for me, um, I really kind of makes me think of Van Gogh's Starry Night, you know, with the nice swirls of paint and uh, the painting of uh, Starry Night kind of has that same effect. You can kind of see swirls over here of nebulosity. and it's just wonderful. Now, Pleiades is great because Pleiades from my light polluted suburban driveway is visible with the naked eye. And you can really tell that you're on it because it kind of looks like a, a bunch of incandescent grapes up in the sky. With binoculars, it's even more spectacular. And, and even with telescopes, um, you know, without the aid of electronically assisted astronomy, you can begin to make out that reflection um, of the uh, of the uh, the starlight off of the nebulosity. So it's really cool. I mean, I I just if you've never seen it before, highly recommend uh, viewing that. Next, we'll move on to the Crab Nebula. Very interesting um, object here. This is actually a supernova remnant. So in a large star, you know, a star many times the size of our own sun runs out of fuel, it catastrophically collapses and explodes and creates this, uh, this wonderful structure that you see out here. Um, the Crab Nebula is about 6,500 light years away from us and about 11 light years in size. So it's a very, very faint, um, small object um, to view through uh, a uh, small telescope probably wouldn't be able to pick it up. You need probably a larger telescope. And um, the um, this this particular uh, supernova occurred about 1054. It was actually witnessed by some Chinese astronomers. So um, you know, it's a documented uh, nova that occurred in our own galaxy here um, some thousand so on years ago. At the center, when I when I when I um, a star, uh, a large star uh, collapses after it runs out of fuel, it will form either a black hole or a neutron star. And in this case, it formed a neutron star. It's actually called the Crab Pulsar, and it's spinning at about 30 times a second. And it's emitting radiation from gamma rays to radio waves. So it's very a very active um, neutron star. Okay, so next we're gonna go over to Auriga, uh, which is that constellation that is in the, uh, uh, over the head and shoulder of Orion. And here we've got three star clusters that are um, really cool to see. Uh, we've got M36, 37, and 38. And finding um, these star clusters, a uh, piece of advice that I would give is to, you know, first of all, Get a get a fix on where Capella is, and then from Capella, kind of navigate your your way down towards the bright star on the opposite end of the constellation, and then in here find those find those uh, star clusters. Here's a uh, a nice image of those star clusters. This is M thirty eight, thirty six, and thirty seven. Uh, thirty seven uh, has about five hundred stars, and it's uh, in the neighborhood of 4,000 light years away from us. Again, this one contains at least 12 red giants. Again, using those stars is a good way to confirm that yes, I'm looking at the proper uh, star cluster. So just uh, just as a reminder, use some of those, those features to help you um, find those stars. Um, next, we'll go over to Gemini and if you remember, we can get there by going from the right shoulder of Orion, from Bellatrix over to Betelgeuse, and that, of course, this drawing's a little off kilter, but it'll get you over to the twins over here. And here we're gonna look at um, a couple of really cool objects. One is an open cluster, M35, and another is a planetary nebula. 
So we'll look at M35 first. Uh, it's about 2,800 light years away, and it's quite large um, by open uh, cluster standards. So um, that's kind of one interesting facet uh, about this star cluster. It has about 300 stars in it. Uh, and again, it's got some um, red giants in it here that will, again, help you uh, confirm you're on the right object. We'll next look at a planetary nebula, uh, NGC 2392. And that's over here. Here's a Hubble view of that, and then a view that you'd see through a small telescope. Now, planetary nebulas are, um, generally speaking, relatively small, um, and they, they are faint. So you're gonna need some help. You either need a large telescope, or in my case, I've been able to see this through electronically assisted astronomy, but you can view it and they're really neat to see. A planetary nebula is kind of on the other end of the scale from a supernova. So a star the size of our own sun, when it, when it um, gets near the end of its life, it'll actually puff up and shed out the outer layers of gas and dust. And then when it does finally run out of fuel, it will collapse down into what they call a white dwarf. And I like to think of a white dwarf and I don't know if this is scientifically correct, but I like to think of it as kind of like a campfire ember. It's out of fuel, but it's still really hot and glowing. And that radiation is what's making this gas that it had previously shed glow and uh, you know create some beautiful colors and patterns. So interesting uh, planetary nebulas are interesting uh, objects. And, and here's an example of one um, that we can see in our winter skies is the Eskimo Nebula. Okay, so now we're gonna go down to uh, Canis Major and Canis Major is the, the, the big dog down here. And that's, uh, you, can, you, you know you're in Canis Major when you can spot Sirius. And Sirius is very uh, bright and obvious. It's the brightest uh, 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 star in the sky. Um, we're gonna look at an open cluster M41 and another open cluster NGC 2362. So let's go to M41. This probably was discovered by Aristotle back before the birth of Christ, but it was officially cataloged by Charles Messier back in 1765. It's about 2300 light years away from us, and it has um, a beautiful orange star at the heart. And again, another great way to tell if you're on the right object. So uh, uh, very nice uh, open cluster. Uh, binoculars or a small telescope would be ideal for viewing something like this. Moving on to NGC 2362. This was discovered back in 1654. It's quite young, uh, estimated age to be about four to five million years. This cluster is a candidate for giant gas or for gas giant study formation. A lot of uh, uh, gas giants in this uh, in this cluster, and it's also known as Tau Canis Majoris cluster after its brightest star, which would be this sucker right here in the in the in the middle. So we've looked at some really cool objects while we're looking in the south part of the sky. Now we're going to turn our attention north because there's a couple of really cool things up in the north that we want to take a look at. So when you turn to the north, the first constellation or at least in my view or my experience, the easiest constellation to pick out is Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia is a distinct uh, M-shaped um, object, or at least when it's high up in the, um, in the sky, and it, it ro rotates around Polaris, so you can see it make its travels through the, uh, the course of the evening. Um, Cassiopeia is the queen, and in its position right about there, uh, the queen is upside down. So that's how in mythical um, drawing um, format uh, you would visualize Cassiopeia, uh, the constellation. One item that is um, really neat, and again, this this is uh, where, where its position will be tonight at about 9 p.m., is uh, the Heart Nebula. And the Heart Nebula is a uh, well, first of all, the Heart Nebula is right off the end of the uh, M, on the, the right-hand side of the M, and um, it is another emission nebula, and 
similar to the Rosette Nebula, you've had this phenomena where the stars in the core of the Hart Nebula have radiated uh, stellar winds that have pushed out gas and given us this uh, beautiful heart-shaped uh, object that's out in the sky. Um, the Hart Nebula is about 6,200 light years away. It's about 107 light years in size. And uh, it is a very, uh, very beautiful object to uh, behold indeed. I've seen it uh, again through the use of electronically assisted astronomy. You don't need a big telescope. As a matter of fact, this is a pretty wide field uh, uh, object. So um, with a smaller, uh, uh, well, with a shorter focal length telescope, you can, um, and, and using EAA, you can find this thing and, and um, get some really um, nice views of it. So that's the Hart Nebula. And then last, we'll move on to Perseus and with the head of Medusa there. And here we uh, would find Perseus in the night sky. Um, and Perseus, in my experience, is a rel it's kind of tough to find because the stars in Perseus aren't um, uh, extremely bright, uh, but they are um, about, uh, well, at nine o'clock tonight anyway, it's gonna be at about one o'clock from Cassiopeia. And so that's kind of how you find Perseus. In this particular case, having a, 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 a phone app like Stellarium or Sky Safari would really help in terms of finding that to make sure you're in the right area of the sky. A um, Couple of really cool objects here. Uh, we'll talk about Algol first. Um, it's a star off on one of the branches here of Perseus. It's a triple star system. And two of the stars are actually eclipsing each other. And it's great because they're in our own line of sight. So we can actually witness this eclipse. And it happens about two days, 20 hours and 49 seconds um, a piece, or at, at that frequency, uh, that eclipse will occur. And what's happening is the uh, fainter companion Beta Perseus B is eclipsing the brighter star Beta Persia A. And so it drops from a magnitude of 2.1 down to 3.4. And they tell me that it can be uh, witnessed with the naked eye. Uh, it's something that I personally have not um, gone out and made an effort to go see, but I definitely have it on my list now. And this animation shows a really nice um, view of that. So you've got um, Perseus B coming around the back and then going in front and dropping the, um, the luminosity of the uh, Perseus A. So really cool looking um, object um, and uh, one to put on your list. The last one I'll leave you with here is uh, the California Nebula. It's a, another emission nebula. It's kind of off on this branch of Perseus. And it is, it looks like this, obviously it has the shape of California, hence its name. But the real star of the show, pardon the pun, is X Perseus. It's this really bright star over here. Not only is that star providing most of the uh, ion, or believed to be providing most of the ionization of this cloud, but it's also what they term a runaway star. And so, and I've got it in my notes here so that I get it stated properly, but it is um, moving at a high velocity relative to its surroundings. So something happened, either it was in the affected zone of a supernova and the shock wave from that, uh, blasted it out of its uh, home position or it had a, gravi a gravitational encounter with a with a star cluster or some other object and that forced it to move in a direction that um, it typically wouldn't but uh, that's that's really kind of a, a neat backstory for the California nebula that the, the X Persei is uh, it's a blue giant and it's about 30 times the size of our sun so in any event um, really cool to look at. Again, my experience, uh, EAA is uh, uh, what I would be, what I had been able to use in order to see this object. Last but not least is Mars. It's it is up in the sky. It's very apparent, uh, so look for that. And on the 31st of this month, there'll be a conjunction between Mars and the Moon. It'll be about six minutes of gap between the two. It won't be like the con uh, the occ occultation we had here last. Descent, or last month, but but it will get uh, close to the moon as well. 
Okay, so here's that table I was telling you about, and I just want—I have a couple of things I just want to uh, uh, talk about here. Number one, these options that you see here are not the be-all end-all. These are strictly options that I put down based on my experience. I wanted to provide people with a guide to kind of help them. Hey, how do I go view this thing? I wanted to kind of give people that direction. But I also wanted to be able to vouch for these. So I didn't want to put something in here that I hadn't personally experienced myself. So can a large telescope find the Horsehead Nebula? Well, given the right scope, the right filters, the right location, probably. I just haven't done that. So that's the, I just want to make sure people understand that this is not something that is cut and dried. It's just simply sharing my experience to help give you um, so a guide in terms of finding these things. In general, with uh, star clusters, you know, binoculars and a small telescope are going to be uh, advisable because they, they are such a wide field of view object. With the smaller ones, you're going to need a larger telescope. There are a few objects here that benefit really from all of them, and Orion, the Orion Nebula is one. So everything from naked eye to the EAA can really benefit from from all those types of um, all those types of uh, of options. Now you may be asking. So another, the last thing I'll leave you with is as a word about EAA. Um, you know, doing EAA on your own can be an expensive and time-consuming endeavor. So you may be asking yourself, well, what good is that? Well, there are a couple of ways that you can experience EAA. Um, I know out at the George Observatory for the fee of admission that we do EAA out there all the time. So if you if you got a Saturday night and you want to go out there, you can see how um, others uh, that have the equipment have have set that up and are viewing things with EAA. So that's one option. I know that some outreach activities are beginning to include EAA. For example, Jeff Lepp, I think, has put together a, a really nice little um, EAA setup that he's taken to some outreach um, um, events. And then I know Carlos, uh, our EAA uh, focal point in the group, I believe he's done some work out at the uh, um, uh, out at the dark site at a star party in, where he had EAA. I'd like to be able to find a way to bring my EAA equipment out to a novice lab. Maybe at some point in time, I'd need to figure out how to do that and adhere to the rules uh, of the dark site. But th that might be another opportunity for people to experience EAA. So again, just want to make sure everybody understands the context of this slide. Uh, so with that, get out there and stargaze, and there'll be more to come in 2023. And then I don't know if Debbie's on the line, but if she, Joe, is Debbie uh, with us tonight? I do not see her on tonight. Okay, well, I'm going to give it anyway, and then I'll give it to her in person when I see her. Um, but anyway, I, I did want to send out a thank you to Debbie for her service. She's been the novice chair for nine years. She's always been eager to share extensive knowledge, always accessible. I remember teeing up this long list of questions and then hitting the send button to her and thinking, well, in a couple of weeks, I'll hear back. And 20 minutes later, I've got answers to my questions plus information I didn't even realize was out there. So very accessible. She did a great job transitioning the novice chair to me. I know I've got some big shoes to fill, but I'm going to do my best, and I hope the New England Patriots guy gets his issues fixed. <laughs> uh, and we'll, and with, that, with that, Joe, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks so much, Chris, and I apologize. <laughs> Look, folks, we made it almost three years without having a Zoom bombing uh, issue, so uh, wow. I'm surprised that it, it, you know, we were able to go that long. No, uh, no problem, real, man. Quick, uh, hey, that's that's I guess the initiation, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Held by fire there for you. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I just wanted to, to show one thing here, um, and I've shown this before. So this is an image of the um, Great Orion Nebula that uh, Will Young took out of my telescope, holding an iPhone to the eyepiece, and it was a uh, I want to say a 10 second exposure. So um, you know, obviously, wow. it, it, it yeah. was. Yeah, 
handheld with a with a with an iPhone, right? In a 25 inch knob. Now, obviously, you don't see the color the way that you see here. This is a, a, a 10 second exposure, but um, the image itself through the eyepiece, I would say, was even more impressive because there was, you know, it was much uh, there was much more clarity, much more definition. Uh, the area, the trapezium, the the stars that you saw were, you know, just tiny pinpoints, and it was really impressive. So. Uh, you know, obviously you're not seeing this naked eye, but the views can actually be a little more impressive, right? You're not getting the color, but you're able to see much more definition. So. Yeah, it's, it's that exposure that really helps you out, Joe. It, yes. You know, I've taken pictures with my DSLR and I've actually blown them up and was able to actually see a hint of the flame nebula, if you can believe that. Yeah. I was taking, you know, so, so that's really the trick is just to get you a little exposure time. It'll help a lot. So. Absolutely. Um, we did have a few questions. Uh, I want people to be able to come off mute and ask those. Uh, I, do, I there, Somebody is trying to register. So I've locked the meeting. Nobody's able to join us right now. Uh, but uh, I wanted to get through the questions one by one. I think Fonda, you were the first person to ask the question, um, to ask a question, I, sh I should say. Was that you, Fonda? Um, I did ask a question. There you go. Yeah. So my question was the you you talk about things can be seen with a large or a small telescope on your last chart. Um, yeah. You actually defined the difference, and that was really my question. Yes, it's in the it's in the uh, the fine print up in the column. But I, I, a small telescope is um, something that would be four inch or less in diameter, typically like a refractor type telescope. A large telescope would be six inch or larger, typically like a Dobsonian or, or, a, or a, a schmidt -Cassegrin. Um that That's kind of what I'm talking about. Perfect, thank you so much for that question. And then I believe Jeff at Munoz, you had a question as well about binoculars. Yes. Um, my question was, what is the best kind of binoculars? Like what is the best, like, um, yeah. Um, so I won't, I'll tell you what I use. Um, not sure I can give you a thorough answer on the best kind because I've really only used a couple of different kinds, but I have a, um, a 10, let me, no, just one second, let me grab them. That way I won't, I won't lie to you. Um, so here are my binoculars. These are 10 by uh, 50, so 10 millimeter diameter by 50 millimeter uh, focal length. And these work wonderful. Um, these, this pair I got, again, they're a Nikon, uh, a pair of Nikons I got off of Amazon. And it was about, I want to say about $130, $140. So, you know, for a brand new pair, that's not bad. You could probably find some used that are um, just as good. I've got a smaller pair that's, I think, a seven by 30 uh, pair of binoculars, an older pair, and they work fine too. Um, and you can get some really big ones too. I mean, you can get some binoculars that are so large, you really need a, a tripod or some kind of a thing to hold them because they can get they can get too heavy. For the, these, for me, are just about right. I can hold these and, you know, long enough to get a view. Um, but I also have a way to use a tripod to, you know, uh, help steady it as well. So, um, again, not the answer, not the best, but what I use and kind of give you some ideas there. Hey, Chris, I'm sorry to, to, to bug you there, interrupt you. Uh, I'd ask, Somebody had asked if I could stop the screen share so they could see your image larger. Would you mind holding those binoculars up again? Yeah, sure. Sorry about right that. Yeah, no problem. So again, uh, 10 by 50 is what we got here. And um, again, they're, they're kind of hefty and they'll tire your arms out, but you know, you just keep them up for, you know, 10, 15 seconds, you should be fine. I'm not, and what does that I'm, 10 by 50 mean? I, the 10 by, so the 10 is the diameter. So the diameter of the lens the, the 50. would be 10, 10, mil, 10 millimeter. And then 50 is the focal length. So this, this the dimension right here, I believe, I hope. No, no, it's, uh, the, 
the the reverse. So, is so reverse? typically, yeah. So ten is usually an indication of the power. So it's the magnification. Um, oh. So ten ten x uh, power, and then fifty is the size of the uh, ocular there, uh, fifty millimeters, right? And oh. so if you get a, a say a nine by sixty three type of binocular, it's a nine x okay. magnification, sixty three millimeter ocular. But the most common ones that you see in in astronomy that I, I that I've seen at least are the ten by fifties that Chris oh, okay. has there. Um, All right, never you mind. See those, yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, very common to see ten by fifties. Um, they're you, once you get a little bit larger than the fifty millimeters, they're uh, a little bit hard to hold, as Chris mentioned. Um, yeah. you, you normally would need tripods at that point to to kind of hold those binoculars steady. Uh, one tip I did want to share though is uh, one of the things that I recommend if you can do it, if you've got like a fence or a vehicle that you could lean against when you're uh, holding those binoculars, it really helps to steady and, and that right. way your, your arms don't get so tired. Another thing that somebody mentioned to me is if you've got a chair, you can sit in the chair, that helps. And if not, you know, depending on where the object is that you're looking at with binoculars, uh, you can actually lie on the ground and then hold the binoculars up and, and scan that way. That uh, helps alleviate some of the issues with arm right. fatigue. Yeah. So your novice chair is a true novice. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Um, yeah. No, I'm glad to glad you cleared that cleared that up. I would have gone on and given that misinformation out. So no appreciate worries. it. Uh, certainly. And I think Bill Spitzeri had a question about the Pleiades star cluster. Bill, did you want to come off? Well, I think you're yes, off. Yes. First of all, we can all see I probably spelled it wrong. My Greek is very weak. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've been for. 50, 60 years, been thinking that the nebulosity around the Pleiades uh, is the nebulosity in which the star cluster formed from that nebulosity, as star clusters do. Mm -hmm. And if I heard you right, you're saying, uh-uh. And um, I, I was wondering if you could just add anything to that. That was news to me. Yes, um, I can't. Uh, like, like our discussion on the moons of, uh, of Jupiter, um, I did my research online. I remember Wikipedia was uh, one of the uh, uh, foremost uh, um, sources of that. I will double check. Um, um, I have I've been known to be wrong, especially with uh, uh, binocular data. So let me follow up on that, Bill, because I uh, I had researched it a while back and took it from um, various uh, slide packs that I put together. But I will uh, will double check and make sure that's the case or uh, clarify that. Thank you very much. And of course, your presentation was terrific. I am I'm compelled to tell you that. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, one other thing I want to add is on the subject of a, a cold weather uh, stuff that you need. My 14 year old grandson received for Christmas, not me, but him. Uh, um, rechargeable electric hand warmers, okay, okay, as opposed to the chemical ones. Yes. And I was a little leery, but then I, my hands are really cold. Well, when I was with him, he said, here, Grandpa, try these out. They were fantastic. They had three different settings, so you can do, you know, low, medium, high. And uh, I'm just saying, check them out if you're interested in some hand warmers there. They were just uh, great. Rechargeable, yeah, so, you know, reusable. Exactly. And you can get gloves like that. You can oh, get yeah, jackets. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of, yeah, it, it definitely. Yeah. All right. Uh, Bram Weissman has his hand up. Bram, do you want to come off of mute and ask a question? Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you for the presentation, Chris, and let, let everyone know that I put a couple of links in the chat. Uh, one is skyandtelescope.org, astronomy equipment, binoculars for astronomy. So that'll help you understand the numbers and decide what size and price point is going to meet your needs. And then uh, there's another one that is a link to Gary Saronic, who, by the way, wrote Sky and Telescope's binocular highlights. So he's definitely an authority on the subject. So um, his website also has uh, a page dedicated to binocular stargazing and some discussion of equipment. Fantastic. Thank you, Bram. And uh, I see Mike Weisman has uh, added some additional tips around foot warmth as well. That's in the chat. 
So uh, folks, if you'd like, go ahead and take a look there. Snag those uh, links before we end the meeting here tonight, because once we end the meeting, the links disappear, but uh, we can do what we can to, to share that uh, afterwards. And then uh, Bob Gillespie said he's got a, a, a picture of his 10 by 50s on a parallelogram mount. Um, yeah, Bob, if you can go ahead and share that, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, if For those of you who've never used a mount before, um, typically you'll see that uh, your traditional uh, tripods, the, the type of uh, mounts that you would put a, a camera or a video camera on. Um, oh, yeah. But when you get to some of the heavier tripods, or excuse me, some of the heavier um, uh, binoculars, uh, a parallelogram tripod like this one really comes in handy. They're, they're, they're fantastic. They help maintain uh, kind of the angle where you're looking at. You can kind of raise them up, lower them, and still be looking at the same object. Uh, you know, so it's, it's really handy when you're sharing the views with other folks who might not be the same height that you are. So, um, Bob, did you want to mention anything about that particular uh, setup that you have there? Bob might be on mute. That, that's the exact pair that I've got, binoculars I have. Yeah, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it looks very similar. There you go. And Bob, we cannot hear you if you are talking. So, uh, but I appreciate you sharing that uh, that image because uh, it's something that many people who are just getting started in the hobby uh, have never seen, right? A parallelogram mount, but they're, I would, you know, my opinion, they're much more comfortable to use um, and uh, I, I enjoy them more so than your traditional tripod uh, mounts for binoculars. Yeah, I was just going to say that those were the, the same um, binoculars as, as Chris has. And I've also used that exact uh, parallel ground amount and tripod for larger binoculars. It really helps a lot. I appreciate that. Okay, any other questions that we have here uh, for Chris before we wrap up for tonight? Going once, going twice. All right. Uh, well, Chris, thank you so much for your presentation. It's uh, absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm glad everybody got uh, all the great information that you were sharing with us today. Um, looking forward to many more of these wonderful presentations. And I really appreciate you stepping in and, and leading this novice group uh, for the next year and hopefully beyond that. So thanks so much, Chris. Happy to do it. Thank you. All right. Um, and tomorrow night, we actually have our general meeting uh, that's going to start at 7 p.m. I'm going to make sure I lock down the Zoom ahead of time. So if you haven't registered for that, uh, when you do register now, it's going to uh, ask for approval. So I've got to go ahead and grant that. So please bear with us. It won't be an automatic thing. But um, tomorrow night, we do have um, Astro Backyard. If you've never heard of Astro Backyard, that's Trevor Jones. He's a pretty well-known astrophotographer, and he's going to be presenting um, on astrophotography from your own backyard. So if you haven't registered yet, go ahead and get that done. And uh, what we'll probably do is keep the, the waiting room enabled and um, make sure that we meet everybody as they enter. So, uh, But we're looking forward to that tomorrow. It's a, another popular uh, presentation. We've got a lot of people registered for that tomorrow. And um, if you have any questions about that, you can see the details about the, the uh, meeting on our website at astronomyhouston.org. And uh, lastly, I always mention this, if you'd like to give us a follow or a like on any of those social media platforms, feel free to do so. And if you have any questions, if you'd like to ask uh, myself a question, Chris a question, uh, please send us an email, info at astronomyhouston.org, and uh, we'll try to get that answered as quickly as possible. So uh, Chris, again, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. We'll go ahead and uh, get this video processed minus the photo bomb <laughs> put, on, put on the YouTube site. So uh, look for that in the coming days. And uh, again, right. thank you everybody for, okay. for sticking with us tonight and we'll see you tomorrow. All take right. care. Everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you guys. Bye.